I'm at Loma Linda University. What's that? Okay, sorry. Something else came on my computer. It's so like I'm currently at Loma Linda University in Loma Linda, California. It's uh, cooler today, but it was 100 degrees a couple of days ago, so probably a little warmer than Canada. Um, I'm a what am I, a research associate and adjunct professor there. This isn't a fossil crab. This is a track. Um, this is a bird track here in Death Valley National Park where I did my PhD work. So if you want to learn more about me and look me up online, you can do a Google search for my name. I've, there's only one Tory Nyborg out there in the world, and I haven't done anything terrible. So there's hopefully nothing too horrible on the on the web about me. So you can see, but you'll see quite a bit about uh, the tracks in Copper Canyon, Death Valley, but you also see quite a bit on crab work as well. So that locality is, is quite amazing because it has, it preserves one of the best Cenozoic um, mammal tracks, mammal and bird tracks in the world. So if anybody is ever down this way in the Death Valley, let me know and I'll take you out there and show you some of these wonderful places out there as well. So going back in time, I did my master's thesis work at Kent State University in Ohio. And if you're gonna pick places to do your research, you should pick a nice place to do your research. Here, this is Newport. Uh, there's a Newport Lighthouse, Newport, Oregon. And these wave cut terraces preserve these small concretions that have these fossil crabs. So that was my that master's thesis work. And I've got about, oh, well, about 70% of that now published. Hey, working on Corey, that. question. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. I climbed down that bank right about where the bottom You're crazy. Left, <laughs> and uh, I went to the right hand side, which was the wrong way to go. And uh, I saw there's some gastropods. So uh, okay. you have your cursor there. Where was the spot that you found those crabs? I know it was this way. Is it yeah, somewhere? It's, it's pretty much in different spots here in the wave cut terraces. Oh gosh. Okay. I walked right so, by them. Darn this isn't the this isn't the best picture. There was when I was doing the collection back in the late late 90s, this the beach was really uncovered. Oh. So it's more covered up now than I haven't been out there for about 10 years now. So I don't know. But uh, yeah, it was it was pretty uncovered. It was because of all the construction they've been doing and re doing all the all the lighthouse area and stuff and that actually occurred the erosion occurred in this area so it exposed it which was quite nice for me but probably not so nice for the the people who live behind it <laughs> falling into the ocean but uh, yeah go back out if you can in the winter time winter's the best but okay. of course it's more scary in the winter and there's not less light so <laughs> but it was a beautiful area to do my thesis i've got most of that work now published which is good and then uh after I got my thesis at Kent State University, I considered going and doing my PhD actually on the crabs from Vancouver Island. And it was one of my possibilities. I ended up going and doing more on the fossil tracks and doing more of a geology work, but I was able to go up uh, with John Pham. This is a very nice earlier picture of John and myself when I was skinny and didn't weigh as much as I do now. And, uh, with Dan Bone, we went out to uh, this, this spot out in uh, the west side, west coast of Vancouver Island. And doing the work with John Pham, we first started the first paper way back in, wait, I'm gonna hold this, this one, 2008. So it's quite a while back. This is by Corners for Nina Bakai. And we're lucky enough with this specimen to have fairly nicely preserved. The whole carapace was very preserved. We had some of the legs um, showing spines and things like that. And we also had the sternum. So we were able to compare it to other relatively closely related taxa. So we were able to make a new genus by Cornish renina. And rarely we do get the nice sternum as well preserved. So he was able to actually compare the sternum to all the other ranonoidy type or ranonid type crabs and determine that we had definitely a different genera and species. So another crab that came out of that first initial work there at uh, the West Coast was uh, <coughs> Renina. 
we called it back then Renina Americana because that's what everybody was calling it, but that was kind of a oh, wastebasket for a lot of the fossils because everything was called Renina Americana. <laughs> look at that a little bit more closely. So if you look at the modern Renina, Renina which is in the Indo-Pacific area, it's quite ornate. It's actually a really cool car, uh, crab. They call it a frog crab. It actually sits right underneath the surface of the sand. In this case, I think this is Hawaiian volcanic sand. And it will wait for like a fish or anything else to come by and we'll use these pincers and like snap it in half. So they're quite predatory and they're quite tasty as well. So and then in the Pacific area, they're eaten quite a bit. So looking at the one we had from Canada and we had ones from Washington and, and Oregon as well, um, the only other two described previously described taxa were Renina Americana and Renina Tejuana. And you can see that these are pretty much I what I call roadkill fossils. Mm -hmm. They're not really giving you a whole lot of detail. And that makes comparison quite difficult. Um, you can kind of say the shape is the same. We've got this little zipper like, my mouse here, we have the zipper like lateral margin, whoops, which is also the same here. But overall, you really have none of the frontal spines. So, really have to have something to make it more diagnostic. So, this one on the left here is a nicely preserved specimen. That actually, this is from Washington State, and it preserves the entire frontal margin, the spine, the side spines, and the whole body for the most part. So if you're trying to compare this to that, you can see the problem and the difficulties that are, can occur here because this really, you cannot compare anything and you just have to call it Renina Americana. But if we look at it, now that we have a nicely preserved specimen, if we look at the frontal margin, you can see that it's quite distinctly different. And Renina Renina has a triangular rostrum, it has a trifid rostrum in the new genus, which I'll talk about in a second. The first anterolateral spine is singular, it's trifid in Renina Renina, and then the other second anterolateral spine is distinctly different also. So that spurred on a paper uh, re-looking at these crabs and we determined that we'd have to pretty much get rid of Renina Americana because there's really no way of diagnostically looking at other specimens that you have to say, okay, is this Renina Americana or is it a different species? So those got sort of put into trash and we were able to actually establish a new gen genus, Renina. And we called it Blandi after Andrew Bland, who did a lot of work in the Washington area. So some of the things that are important here is the rostrum, it's trifid. The first anterolateral spine, spine is singular and sharp. And then the second anterolateral spine indicates more like species variation. So if we look at the one I have from the West Coast of Vancouver Island, um, it also falls within that Afrinin or Blandi. The rostrum itself is not trifid here, and that's probably due to prepping, or maybe it's still below underneath the matrix here. But I've seen other specimens from that area, and they do have a trifid uh, rostrum. The first anterolateral spine is singular and sharp, and then we have the bifid second anterolateral spine. So it looks like that one is Amphorinina blandi. Now there's other ones from Washington that are a little bit different in that the, the second anterolateral spine has variation. It's either trifid, or in this case, it's trifid with a little extra spine on the side. And it gets into the question of how many species you have to actually look at variations. Is it a sexual dimorphism variation, or is it, in this case, probably an intraspecific variation? And 
don't know yet if these are actually separate species or not because we don't have enough specimens to make that decision. So on the paper, we ended up just calling it, there's a little bit of a variation there between, variation between the second anterolateral spines. And that goes into question for Nuka Island, which was just visited by Dan and others. Uh, this is from uh, James Wood. He sent me down this specimen. Um, it probably has the trifid rostrum and needs to be cleaned. But that's important to note when prepping this that it probably does have a trifid rostrum. And then if you look at the second anterolateral spine, the first one again is sharp and singular. And then the second one has three points to it. So it is somewhat similar to the ones from Washington State. So right now, it's probably interspecific variation, but it's a question of how many specimens we can get to see if there is actually this variation going on, or, or do we have separate species. And the Renina are kind of one of those weird crabs that there is quite a big variation within those spines. Now, if you look at the the Renina Renina, and you look at the adult male, the female, and the juvenile, um, they're pretty much the same. There really is no sexual, there is sexual dimorphism between the male and the female. There's a little bit, the male has much broader and bigger second and first anterolateral spines, but the numbers are all the same between all the way from the juvenile female and then the adult male. So it comes into question is if that's true with Renina Renina, perhaps these are separate species and not interspecific variation. But again, it's a matter of how many specimens to actually make that comparison. So again, looking at that, we'll have to figure that out down the road. So that's one thing that, one area that we have to look at for fossil crabs. And then the other area is looking at the differences between the juvenile and the adult. Now, if you have enough specimens, you could figure out look at the, all the differences and then uh, plot that against length and width. So, you know, crabs go through quite a bit of molt stages. And here's just a uh, Mercia here. You can see all the molt stages that have occurred. So this is from my master's thesis from the Astoria Formation again, the place that Dan had been to at uh, Newport. So if you look at the juvenile and adult, and if you just have one specimen of each, you might say, well, these look very different and maybe they are separate species. But if you get enough specimens, in this case, what I have, my screen is there, but I've got quite a few specimens here and you plot them just using length and width, you get a fairly high correlation rate. And you can almost plot them into molt stages, possibly. So in this case, it looks like we have from juvenile to adult, we have the same species. It just has changed through time. So that's an important aspect when describing these fossil crabs. And this can be used with other ones like Orbitoplex weaveri. This is from California. Didn't plot out quite as nicely, but it also has a, a fairly high coefficient of correlation. So if there's a large amount of specimens, and in this case, there isn't really a huge amount, but um, with fossil specimens, there's not a whole lot that are all preserved to the point where you can do complete length and width. So you want to look through growth allometric stages of these crabs. And then going back again, looking at sexual dimorphism. So again, the adult heel here has much broader first and second anterolateral spines compared to the female. And then oftentimes we only get one specimen preserved. This is also from the Astoria formation. It wasn't included in my thesis because we only had one specimen, but it's such a rare one out of all of the concretions. And it goes to, goes to show that how many, many of you probably know when you go out looking for fossils that you, there's a very common crab or the very common fossil at the locality. And then after you've broken like 100 or 200 concretions, you find an odd one you'll find only one out of all of probably a thousand concretions that I came across, I only came across one of these. So in this case, it is worth describing because although we'd like to have multiple specimens, in this case, you're probably only gonna get the one specimen unless 
to com come across another 500 concretions. Okay, and then another thing to consider is prep and cleaning of the crabs. Um, this is Megakos lascensis, we're from Alaska, hence the name, the species name. And then this is actually maybe Macrospinus, maybe something, a new species. I'm still deciding on that from the Hesquiet Formation, again on the west coast, Vancouver Island. And you notice that they have this very distinct two teeth right along the midline, on either side of the midline, on both of these. Some of them are more distinct than the other in the species. Hmm. You get into the problem when um, you have a specimen that has been I know it's difficult to prep specimen, but I've tried myself and this looks more like what I would probably end up prepping a specimen. But if you prep it, it's easy to knock off some of those very diagnostic features, such in this case, this two teeth on the midline here, either side of the midline. And that becomes a problem because when you look at other specimens and you look at this one, which has now been moved to Megakos, Feldmani, been moved to the genus Megakos. This one obviously is quite nicely prepped. There's no signs of it being unprepped wrongly. We've got quite a few of these specimens and they have this very triangular rostrum. So in this case, Megakos should have those two again. It's fine on the other side of the midline. So that becomes a problem too. So it's important to, to prep them out fairly nicely. So this is just sort of a little background. I didn't want to put too much fossil crab pictures at you. I want to put a little background too. I've got chats. What do we got chats? Okay. I have to, I have to do the chat ones afterwards. Sorry, I guess. <laughs> got some people ask me questions. Ask me questions at the very end. It'd probably be easier. So you want to look for the growth stages from juvenile to adult, if possible. Sexual dimorphism. So anywhere from the pretty much the female and male intrapacific variation, that becomes very difficult because some crabs have more variation than others. And then be careful when looking at just one specimen, but oftentimes we have just that one specimen. And then the prep and cleaning of the fossil specimens is also quite important to make certain that. And oftentimes the problem with that is they'll like the Renina crab that has just that, you know, that nice triangular rostrum, you think, okay, that's how it's going to look, but in actuality, it has a trifid, so you might be prepping it thinking, okay, it just has that triangular rostrum, and I prepped it correctly. And again, that's difficult, I understand, because, you know, let's see. All right, so we got this one done. So this is the Amphernia blandi now. We're still mm -hmm. questioning the one from Nuka Island, and then we also have uh, another specimen that was collected by, by Jay um, from also from this West Coast. So we are able to name that along with several other Macrochira specimens we called the Macrochira J.I. named after him. So because he found, again, this is only, only one single specimen was found, but out of all the ones that I've looked at, and I'm sure Dan has looked at, this is probably the only one that we have seen of this Macrochira. Yeah. So this is this guy right here, compared to this drawing here. And then we want to look at the Megakos at some point in time now. That's because it may be a different species. OK. Also sticking with the west coast of Vancouver Island. And I think uh, Dan Bowen talked about this uh, last time on the Nuka Island. We have these isopods. James Wood was very kind to send these down to me. Um, they're very interesting, very unique. I don't think there's any been described from uh, Vancouver Island. Um, I put a question mark as the Hesquiet formation. I'm not positive yet. I need to figure that one out, but it looks similar to that type of formation. So several of the ones that could be is Bathynomus. Bathynomus is huge. The modern one, obviously, that's why it's called Gigantus. It has that very broad last part of it and lots of spines. 
very similar. Or it could be Pelega, uh, this is Pelega Godertorum. Mm. It's also very similar as well. Um, just doing a quick research on the two, there's a different, there's two different caps. The more modern people really don't like the name Pelega, so they prefer Bathynomus. So there's gonna be a little bit of work to do on that. But we've got some very, those are pretty complete specimens. So I think we could definitely move forward with working on that and most likely may name a new species. Okay, now moving away from the West Coast into, I guess you call it the, not the mainland, but the main part of the island. Um, looking at Appian Way, the Paleocene now, I believe it's now put into. We have, I've got these, oh, I can actually move them, good. I have these, I see people on the side, so I can't read my, my handwriting. Uh, this is Manidopsis canadensis, uh, we described. This was collected by Rick Ross. Kindly donated it to me to work on. There's still several taxa from Appian Way that need to be looked at. Uh, Rick Ross also sent me an homolid, but uh, unfortunately it's quite crushed and there's not enough diagnostic features to determine it. But there is a interesting line of pairs and just showing that to Alexandro today, my yeah. co-author on a lot of my paper, Alexander Garasino, he does think it might be most likely actually a new species. So it's quite interesting. Okay, moving quite forward quickly into the Nanaima group. So we've gone from sort of the Cenozoic uh, West Coast. Now we're going to the other side of the island. And this is from uh, Mustard and Haggart. This nice map showing the outcrops of the Nanama group and then their nice strike, strike, uh, stratigraphic section that they have. And a good share of the fossils really come from this Nanama group, as most of you know up there in Canada. Nanama. So from there, we are able to relook at and revise the Archaeopus, which is a quite common crab in, within the Nanama group. Sandy, who did a great job on a lot of this stuff, helped out with all the drawings and really, really was definitely worth the second authorship on that, if not the first almost. But from that, we were able to name Archaeopus hoploceratus, which is this guy over here. I'm gonna keep moving the screen here. And then Archaeopus burgessi, which is this guy here. And note that there is you know, there is some interspecific variation here, but for the most part, we have pretty complete specimens and we're able to actually look at them in detail and make these drawings based upon the specimens. So probably enough there to warrant uh, making new species. Uh, previously described was Archaeopus rostratus, 2003, which should be this guy here. So it was reevaluated and amended and then also Archaeopus bicronatus, right here, was also amended. So we're able to name two new species and amend these two. This is Archaeopus vancouverensis. We did a little bit of amending, but not much. And this is marinaensis, which is from California. So from looking at all the specimens that we had gathered up over the years, we we're able to compare all of the known Archaeopus crabs and look at the the frontal region, which is actually quite distinct on all of these. So look at the differences and then actually plot out the ages. Now, so Sandy did this as well. He did a lot of work on this paper. So, uh, moving to uh, a new locality that Dan Bowden had discovered and was kind enough to share his fossils with me. Um, this is over by, by Victoria area but it's also within the Nanama group, a little older. It's probably comparable to the uh, Calicum Lake area. So we're able to name this new species, Petrolithus lenzensi. And then we have another odd Paradoxy, Paradoxy carcinus. Um, I put the question mark on here because it does look a little bit different. So I need to look at this a little bit more closely and determine if we actually do have a new species or not.
So basically, you know, you get this fossil and you can compare it like we did here with all the other species that are previously described and then determine based upon that if there is enough differences to warrant a new species or a new genus. Okay, and then also from the NEMA group, uh, within this paper talking about homolids, we were able to name one that Dan very nicely donated. So we actually named it after him, Cretolohoma bolonii. So it's actually quite nice, nicely preserved with these very interesting uh, interlateral spines there. All right, and then we're actually able to go back and since we have wonderful people like John Pham, who's been donating to me lots of his fossil crabs. We get this beautiful, well-preserved uh, one that was already described, pre-clarocarcinus. Pre so we're able to go in there and amend it. So reevaluate it and look at it a little bit more closely and put it within the right uh, systematic placement. So based upon some better preserved specimens. So that was another recent paper. Another paper that uh, Rick, and this is actually collected by Cynthia Lane from Hornby Island. It's a very small little crab, but very distinct and quite interesting. So we're able to name it a, a new species as well, Cephalodromides lanii. And from Hornby Island, we also have um, what's called the Brancocarcinus, although it's probably, it goes back and forth right now as to the different genera. In this paper, I described one from California and this one came from Hornby Island and it wasn't quite preserved quite well enough to make it a new species. So we ended up just putting it as SP. So it's probably just a regular species, but now we have some nicer preserved specimens from Rick Ross. So we're working on that to probably move forward with describing this as a new species from the Hornby Island. That's with Francisco Vega and Rick Ross. All right, moving quite forward along here. So I wanna to try to get within the time period that I have. So there's a lot of stuff and if I've missed a few things, I apologize and hopefully I haven't totally named things wrong here. Uh, this is current work that we're working on. Jim Haggart right now has this paper and hopefully he's working diligently on the geology, hopefully of it. Um, this is from the, I'm going to butcher the name, Hadagua. Is that how I say Hadagua? Okay, this is from Hadagua, formerly the Queen Charlotte Islands. Um, interesting stuff coming out of there. Pretty much everything that comes out of there is fairly new and been described by other people. I'm not going to go into other people's work, but for the only my work. Um, very interesting lobsters from there. This is Paleoestes. Aestacus hadiensis. Um, this is all based upon new work that's been done by uh, Silviano Chabier and uh, other people who have looked at all these grooves and sort of reassigned these genera. So again, this is unpublished work, but for the most part, we're going to put this, try to put this as an as a new species. This one's an odd one. This is from Graham Beard. I collected, he, he let me loan many, many years ago and I shout out to Graham. I'm sorry it took so long to get it done, <laughs> but it's such an odd one. And luckily, um, Alexander Garasino is helping me figure this one out. So it's gonna be a new genera and a new species. So it's a little bit odd, a new lobster. And then Homeris um, Fami, named for John Fam because he actually uh, donated this to be studied. This one's interesting because a lot of these crabs previously, this kind of looks like a hoploperia. A lot of people probably call this, would call this hoploperia, but a lot of the hoploperia probably are homeris from Vancouver Island. And that you could tell quite easily the post cervical groove and the cervical groove should be connected. And if there's a space where they're not connected here, then it most likely is homeris instead. That's a quick and easy. Alessandro Garasino would tell you tell you more about how, how to distinguish them, but that is a very quick way of figuring that out. So that uh, Hoploperia sudai that was described way back in 2003 probably is Homeris. Okay, some other current work and future work. 
I would like to work on is this group, um, which we see a lot of, uh, the Joe Renina RVI. Uh, he used to call it Pedocaristes. It's come under different names, but most recent systematics puts it within Joe Renina. Um, the problem with this is Woodward collected this way back when, and this is what we have to go on. It's not great by any means. Um, and type specimen should be at the Royal British Columbia Museum, but we've had difficulties relocating the specimen to figure out exactly if these spines are actually spines here. He has this as, as bifid, but as far as I've seen all the specimens of this kind of crab, this is not bifid. This is always singular. And I think he's sort of using uh, artistic craziness here and actually adding an extra spine here. And then he's actually adding another spine here, what it actually is just, just a small bump, which you can kind of see right here. So people have sort of separated this one out and just made it Joe Renina Harvey eye and sort of said, okay, this one's weird and it's got these odd spines Anterolateral spine, so we're just going to make that Harvey eye. But in actuality, this may be very similar to the specimens that we've collected from Vancouver Island. So, Joe Renina platus was considered very similar to what we had here. So, we have this one Harvey eye, which they're saying is separate because it's got all these crazy spines, but in actuality, it probably doesn't. So the Harvey Eye was sort of by itself, and then everything else was named Platus, Dorinina Platus. And that actually has come from the Hudspeth Formation in Oregon. So um, several workers have placed Platus as these type of specimens here. So they've named these Dorinina Platus. We have um, better specimens now. This is just one of them. And you can kind of see remnants of these grooves. This specimen was exposed. Obviously, it's got iron oxide going on here, and it's been exposed to the surface. So it's lost a lot of its cuticle. It's a lot of its details. But you can kind of see some of the grooves here, which match up to this much better preserved specimen recently found. So platus was considered plain. That's the word plain, when in actuality, it's quite distinct and quite ornate. It's kind of like a little mouse trap in here. So it's not, probably not even Joe Renina. So we have to look at that a little bit more. But we can definitely say that this from Vancouver Island is not platus. So Joe Renina platus is not occurring on Vancouver Island. And then we got some weird ones here. This is from Pollock and Lake, and this is from Don Ball. We don't need this, and I've tried to publish it once already. It's, it's a problem because this distinctly is different from this. Um, it's got tubercles here, which aren't here. It, the spines are distinctly different. So it's, it's, it's a problem there. So we need to actually look at all of these and then try to figure out how we're going to figure out the Joe Renina section. And, now uh, there's Harvey eye, or there's a different species here. Is this even Joe Renina? So there's some questions there to still answer on those. So if we ever can find the type specimen of Joe Renina Harvey eye, then we can figure out if this actually is Harvey eye or not. Uh, to me, again, these spines are added, so it's hard to say for certain that these are two spines coming off here. It looks more like just the one spine as we see here. All right, so if we're gonna look for growth series, hopefully, uh, from juvenile to adult, sexual dimorphism, so the intra-Pacific variation, and be careful when naming new species based on one specimen. But again, if that's all you have out of thousands of ones that you've looked at, then that's what we get. And then prepping and cleaning of specimens is quite important as well, just looking at it and determining 
several specimens and determine if the, if the prep and cleaning job has been done correctly or not, because that might throw you for a loop. All right. All right, I got it within 45 minutes, so that's good. So again, that was a lot of information. I didn't want to put too crazy, too much out there for you. Um, there are my two emails and my cell phone number. And <coughs> with John Fan, we correspond via WhatsApp. I know since we're in two different countries that maybe that's probably easier in the end. So that's just a touch on work that I've been doing within Vancouver Island. I mean, there's been a lot more, I could have gone more into detail on Oregon and Washington and California as well, but uh, that gives you an idea of what I'm doing right now. Um, 